Um, okay, so what we're going to talk about today is the novel hypothesis that we live in a binary star system and that um, star core Zeus is the remains of the companion star of the Sun and it blew up 4.6 billion years ago at the formation of the solar system. Uh, I'm also going to explain what Pangaea is because it's not a supercontinent and I'm also going to explain how the moon formed which is an area of controversy at the moment where there are a lot of moon formation theories but um, unfortunately none of them actually fit all the data and so at the moment it's a major conundrum to explain where the moon comes from. Okay, so to start, I've shown the slide before. This is the local environment around the solar system. The crosshairs are where we are. This is 3,000 light years from here to here, 3,000 light years from here to here. This is in parsecs, that's why there's smaller numbers. So that's 6,000 light years across. That's a very big explosion. It's a very old explosion. And this is where the gas clouds from the exploding star ended up after 4.6 billion years. Um, Okay, today, Zeus is a cold object. It doesn't radiate much light. Um, these are cooling curves. This is fairly well established for white dwarfs as they cool down. Now, heavy white dwarfs actually lose heat very slowly, so they are still visible, and that's why we can still observe them. But much smaller white dwarfs, that is um, degenerate matter, this is not a neutron star, this is not a black hole, it's just degenerate crushed matter, um, when it's about 10% of a solar mass, it's a body about the size, two or three times size of Earth, and has enough um, time over four billion years to radiate almost away all its heat, so it's no longer visible. However, Starkle's use is a magnetic object. It came from a magnetic star, so it generates a radio frequency output. In addition, it's not totally cold. And recently, a space telescope went up for detection of infrared. That's the Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer, which is still in business under a new title, NeoWISE. It looks for near-Earth objects. And in fact, at the center of the radio signal, you can find a hot object. Well, not that hot, but it's, a, um, it's, a hundred, it's about a 100 Kelvin object. So these are the images. Um, this is the radio image. And there's actually two radio images here, and you can see they're not in the same place. And that's really interesting, because that means that you're looking at an object which is moving. But it's not moving because um, it's in a sort of close orbit. It's because we're moving around the sun. This is a parallax effect. But from that, you can estimate more or less how far away it is. Um, this uh, infrared source corresponds to that source, but this is on a much more um, larger scale. I mean, a more um, detailed scale. Let's go this way. Okay, so just to give a very big picture of what we're talking about, this is the solar system out to the orbit of Neptune. That's 30 astronomical units. Um, if you are where we are here, and you look towards Sirius, you're actually looking 8.6 light years away. So this is a sort of... Um, a diagram showing you the direction. It's not showing you how big the orbit is. It's not a 8.6 light year orbit. The orbit of the star core is about 500 astronomical units. That's 500 times the distance from the Earth to the Sun. Um, at the moment, the star core is about here. So the line of sight takes you over to an area of sky between Sirius and Orion. And in fact, you can get that on Google Sky. And you can even, there's something there. I don't know what it is. You know, it's, but there's definitely something there. Um, Maybe that is to do with the object. Um, now, when we finally observe Starkle's use, it's going to be a dark sphere, and it's going to be surrounded by a torus of dust. And um, it travels in a very eccentric, steeply inclined orbit. That means it's got a stretched out orbit like a comet, and it's approximately perpendicular to the uh, plane of the average orbit of all the planets of our solar system. Um, the Sun and Zeus actually orbit each other, so our whole solar system is in motion orbiting the common center of mass with Zeus and the Sun, because Zeus is the, is the lighter body, we only wobble a bit, but over a 4,000 year period. Um, 
The important point is that I think Zeus has got so close to the Earth from time to time, it's been responsible for serious geological changes on our planet. So not only did it get close enough to pull up mountains, it actually got so close it once ripped off the surface of our planet. And it's due back, 2372. So we're still going to be okay. We've got some time to make our plans. <laughs> um, right, this is a simulation, but it, gets, it just gives you the idea. Right, well, this is actually nine months speeded up. So what it's doing, I'll do it again so you can see what's going on. It's coming over the north pole of the sun approximately, and then it's crossing, it's crossing the Earth orbit just here. And it comes through very quickly. It's doing about 50 kilometers a second at that point. The reason the solar system is still sort of intact is because the forces are acting when it's coming on that side and that side approximately the same. So it, it causes us to wobble, but we basically carry on in the same disk. But there's more modeling that needs to be done on that. Um, so that's, that's just a very basic introduction to what the concept's about. That is, we live in a binary star system. It's a binary star system with a condensed object, which is almost invisible, but it does have a radio signal. It does have a heat source. Now, I'm going to switch onto a related subject. There's a lot of, um, one last one for those. OK. OK, all these titles I put in red are just to give you a sort of section break. So you know I'm changing subject. Um, OK, we're all generally familiar with the idea of how the tides are formed. That is, the moon acts on the oceans. In fact, there's a tidal bulge on the same side of the moon and on the opposite side of the moon. And because the Earth rotates, the bulges actually get displaced. But the net effect is you generally get two tides a day, although there are some exceptions to that. But the important point, the general concept of the moon raising tides can be applied to a very much larger body getting close to the, to the Earth. If you have very big forces, you can make mountains. And um, mountain ranges span the globe. No one has a good model of how they form. I mean, you can sort of maybe explain some volcanic activity in some small area and say you make a volcano. But to make mountains that cross the whole planet, you've got to have a sort of planet scale phenomena. And um, when mountain ranges appear, they tend to be associated with cataclysmic breaks in the geological record and the fossil record. Um, and in fact, field studies show very strange things. You'll find big slabs of rock that have literally been lifted up and dropped down on top of other bits of rock. And the younger rock is below the older rock. It's hard to explain how that happened. Um, so generally, it seems that there's some very powerful force involved in building uh, mountain ranges. Uh, and this is just a little illustration. I mean, these are the sort of the, the well-known mountain ranges that span the whole planet. And the general idea is rather than, you know, two continents pushing together and pushing up a mountain, something from above is actually pulling the, the, the mountain out of the ground, effectively. And there's a, a real sort of laboratory <laughs> experiment that you can, you can do, which is Io, which is the innermost moon of Jupiter, has an elliptical orbit. And so during its orbit around Jupiter, Sometimes it's closer to Jupiter, sometimes further away. So the moon is constantly being squeezed and pulled. And um, it has mountains, has mountain ranges. And they look very, very similar to Earth mountain ranges. Here's a picture. That was taken by the Galileo spacecraft. And I took that picture over Turkey. And they look very similar. I mean, the actual shape. OK, I'm going to change subject again. Sorry, I have to, I'm giving you lots of different bits of information. I'm going to put them all together at the end. OK, continents and oceans, oceans and continents. People just accept the fact we have a, oceans and continents. But it's something very strange. It's a very asymmetric planet we have. It's, why do we have these two platforms of rock? They're separated by approximately five kilometers. They're different materials. It's very strange. Um, generally, we think of land is only 30% of the whole planet. And that's simply because the continental platforms are actually, some of it is underwater. So in fact, the continental rock is about 50% of the Earth's surface, and the ocean floor rock is about 50% of the, ocean, of the um, planet's surface. But the big question is how? Why did it happen? When did it happen? Um, this is just a nice diagram pulled off the internet, but it, can, it, can, it helps you see where the bits of Pangaea are. This is the standard 
model of Pangaea, which you'll get in any textbook, um, it's, it's accepted that at the end of the Permian, all the continents are clustered together in some arrangement like this, and that Pangaea is effectively 50% of the Earth's surface. Um, the important thing also to understand is the South Pole is in Botswana, so it's about here. That, that's where it was. We know that from uh, tilites, which is glacial till, which has been formed into rock um, at 250 million years ago. So some ancient glacial deposit. Now, this is the sort of standard plate tectonics idea of Pangaea. So it's sort of a bit of a mess. Um, it's supposed to be just a random clustering. It just happened to occur by chance. Plate tectonics people will tell you that a billion years ago, two billion years ago, continents were moving around the planet. Um, I'm saying that, in fact, there's something very special about Pangaea, the clustering of those continents. Okay, the assumptions that plate tectonics theory makes is, as I said just now, Pangaea has no special significance. It just happened that they all collided, all the continents collided into each other and formed some conglomerate continent before breaking up again. Um, plate tectonics theory also assumes that continents are moving all the time. It's a continuous process. It's generated from inside the Earth. Um, plate, tect plate tectonics theory also assumes that continents are actually floating on some mobile layer um, in the outer mantle. And th if you read any textbook now, they'll say it's about 8, 10 centimeters a year, the movement. So you should be able to measure it. Um, now we look at the actual evidence. Okay. The idea is that the continents float on this thing called the asthenosphere, which is supposed to be fluid or semi-fluid. But when you look at seismic data, there's no fluid layer. It's all solid. Um, there is actually no evidence of steady widening of oceans. We have lots of electronic equipment now, like um, very long baseline arrays, GPS, lots of measuring systems, and you can't detect consistent movement of continents. You can find lots of wobbles and changes of shape, but you can't find this continuous drift that we think should be happening. Um, there is definitely some evidence that mantle plumes occur, but there's no evidence that mantle plumes are driving continents to move. And in fact, there are very few mantle plumes in the right places. They're not underneath the spreading centers in the middle of the Atlantic, for example. There's one in Iceland, and there's one down somewhere near Africa, and that's it. But this, this whole area, which is supposed to be separating America from Europe, is just inactive. It's not happening now. Um, and the final point is that even though this is often buried in textbooks, if you actually calculate the force necessary to push a whole continent through solid rock, it's enormous. It's much bigger than anything you can get from thermal activity inside the planet. It's a huge, huge amount of force needed to pick up and move a continent. Um, in addition, when you look at the tectonic models, some bits are obvious. You know, this connection is very good. Okay? But this is very strange over here. And in fact, there are a number of errors in the way you can assemble the continents. And in fact, this model here shows you can assemble it in a much more close-packed way. So you end up with a hemisphere rather than a sort of spread out sort of cluster of continental material. And the final point is that there's a very strange story behind this supposed sea called the Tethys Sea, which is a, a sea that separates India from Eurasia, and it's a huge, basically huge ocean, because it never existed. There's no evidence for it. Um, I have a suspicion it's something to do with this. Um, okay, if you fly to America and you look at these navigation maps, you'll see this all the time. You can look at what the underfloor, undersea topology looks like. And there's a triangle of rock, of land here, that fits very nicely into here. And it looks remarkably like where Atlantis was supposed to be. And I have a suspicion that at some point, someone realized that well, we've just assembled all these continental bits and we've just proved Atlantis exists. So I thought, better get rid of that. And so if you twist Europe, you get rid of Atlantis. Okay? Maybe that's not the explanation, but you know, it's it definitely something strange. <laughs> right, so there are two models of Pangaea. There's tectonic Pangaea, which is a sort of open arrangement. And here, this is Tethys Sea here. And there is the new Pangaea model that I assembled here. And you can absolutely assemble the, 
the continents very, very closely together. It's, and the big breakthrough, and I'll talk about it in more detail, is that I realize that Spain and Sicily fit into Libya really well. And if, you, if that's, that's like the key to then breaking the puzzle, and you then start modeling all around that, and you find everything fits together beautifully. Uh, and that's what I just mentioned there. So um, you can see that, and it's not just, you know, just looking at pictures. You can look at geological uh, publications on the type of faults, and you can see that Spain and North Africa move relative to each other in a transverse fault. Um, and following on round, you stick Atlantis back in. Sorry, it does exist. Um, then um, Turkey is pushed up into the Black Sea Basin. Um, the Rift Valley was a very active fault that, in fact, there's a slip of land north-south along the Rift Valley of Africa. And um, basically, you can just assemble everything together. You get rid of the Mediterranean Basin, and you end up with a hemisphere. And I'll I'll, I won't dwell too long on these things, but I want to show you a few features. One is this area, the Caribbean, is always a mystery to tectonic people because the underwater, there's basically continental rock. And yet the deep basins there look like impact craters. Um, also, you can see that these uh, blue arrows are showing the distance of travel from Pangaea, the new Pangaea model, to present arrangements. It's not very, it's not a huge motion. If you go back to plate tectonics theory, you'll find continents going everywhere, you know, driving all over the planet. So it's, it's a relatively small movement to go from the new, the new Pangaea model to the present arrangement. And I'll illustrate the idea about craters. Basically, Cuba looks remarkably like half a crater. All right? So I went looking on the other side. This is um, Google, Google Earth. In fact, on old charts, this comes up much better. But there's a half a crater off Africa as well. And if you assemble everything together, the craters match up. Okay? Now, this is not a high-speed asteroid impact. There's something different. It seems like huge chunks of rock, earth rock, came in at quite low velocity and smashed into the planet. Okay? Um, OK, so I have the details there. And the fractures from this impact and the related impacts are probably what shattered Pangaea, because it's a big question. Pangaea was supposed to be a supercontinent, very 50 kilometer thick rock. Again, you need a lot of force to break something like that. Um, OK, the, but the critical idea is that the new Pangaea construction is the shape of a bowl. It's, it's, a, it's a hemisphere. And um, the continents do fit together very well. And you can fill in a lot of gaps. I mean, you can look at this model afterwards. But um, for example, the Arctic Ocean was formed by a chunk of continent actually being moving towards Kamchatka and the sort of eastern end of Siberia. Um, Tethys Sea doesn't exist in this model, don't need it. And that means that India is connected to Asia, and all the fossil information shows that's always been the case. Um, so basically, you get one continuous hemisphere. And the other thing is the Himalayas are quite interesting because they're basically almost like two bits of continent stacked on top of each other. And in fact, there's geological evidence for that as well. Um, and again, just saying what I was talking about, the Arctic Ocean. So this bit of Siberia moved that way. You know, these arrows are exactly the travel, distance of travel. And that's how you end up this weird sort of triangular shape in the um, Arctic Ocean. Okay, the other thing that's very interesting about this model is that if you leave Africa more or less in the same place and um, you build the new Pangaea, the Botswana was where the South Pole was. And you look on the other side of the globe and you get to Hawaii on the other side. Now, Hawaii is a very strange place. It's a very unstable, geologically active volcanic region. It's got very deep um, fractures into the planet. There's a lot of plume activity. Something very strange about it. And this is probably where the main takeoff point from the moon actually happened. Um, and just this picture just to show, OK, this is new Pangaea model. And again, you can see it's a bit like something went bang, and it's gone that way. All right? And you get to that, which is us. Um, OK. So the big idea is New Pangaea was not a supercontinent. It was half the old crust of our planet. And the other half is missing.
but it was never a continent. It was never something with an ocean basin. Okay? So what I'm saying is there never was a Permian Pacific ocean basin. Right? Um, at the time of the Permian period, there was one continuous crust made of continental rock. Um, yes, there were oceans, but they were very shallow. And in fact, people never really think too deeply about, yes, you'll find marine fossils on land, but you'll never find marine fossils underwater. And there's got to be an explanation for that. I mean, from that Paleo uh, Paleozoic period. Okay. So where did the crust go? That's the big question. Okay, I'm going to just quickly dwell on ocean basins mystery. Nobody knows how you make an ocean basin. No one's come up with a good theory. Um, half the surface of the Earth is made of ocean floor basalt, and it's not very old. It's only it's up to 250 million years old. It's between 150 and 250 million years old. The rocks we can find, um, and th but the land, the granite, is up was well, at least four billion years old. I mean, we keep finding older rocks, but that's, there's a huge difference in age. Um, you find Paleozoic marine organisms on land, in, uh, fossilized, but you don't find them on the ocean floor. And there's simply no evidence for ocean basins before the, um, in the Mesozoic period. Uh, so basically, all ocean basins are strangely young. Um, if you look at the fossils, um, you can't find any fossils that relate to deep water organisms until you get to the Mesozoic, because there wasn't any deep ocean basins. That's basically the explanation for the lack of those fossils. Um, there's a strange thing about the beginning of the Triassic. I'm assuming we're talking geological periods here. So Permian, you have the Great Permian Extinction, then you move on to the Triassic, okay? Okay, so the Triassic is a time when the land was very, very dry, there were no ice sheets, the seawater was twice as saline as today, it's very salty, and, but then over the next 50 million years, the ocean filled up and the seawater got less salty. Where did the water come from? There were no glaciers. Big, big question. We just don't know. And I love this. This is a, in fact, this is a 400 BC vase, which is in a museum in Moscow, which shows some astronomical object pouring water down on Earth. And that was some Greek mythology. I mean, that is, that's not Zeus, so someone else, someone else can help me on that one. Um, okay, new subject again. Destruction of Pangaea. It's, I mentioned it's a great big chunk of the planet. How did it get broken? It takes huge forces to break a continent. Um, and the breaking of the uh, supercontinent, so-called supercontinent, into fragments also coincides with the formation of mountain ranges. You also have this incredible um, flood basalt bleed of liquid magma in Siberia at the same time. These are co coincident events and no one's got a good explanation for this catastrophe. So it appears it's something to do with death from space. Um, there are concentrations of unusual materials. You don't find asteroid impact materials, which are things like iridium and shocked quartz, but you do find uh, a lot of strange um, heavy metals and fullerenes, which are associated with supernova debris. And um, in fact, if you go to Exeter in a museum there, you'll see these big nodules, which actually come from the Permian-Triassic interface, and they contain all sorts of weird things. They're also radioactive. They've got uranium in them, vanadium, all sorts of things. Some fallout happened at the time of this disaster. Um, so the question is, who done it? Um, in addition to these, the fracturing of the continents, the appearance of mountains bleeding out of basalt, something very strange happened to the rock strata. Now, this is a standard geological column, so we go down, and there's the Permian. So, sorry, this is going from the oldest to the youngest. Okay, sorry. So, going, there's the Permian, there's the Triassic. And, sorry, it's an American illustration, so that would be, we'd call it Carboniferous, this bit here. Okay? Uh, it's missing. All right? in, a lot, in most parts of the world, the Permian just doesn't exist. You jump straight from the Carboniferous to the Triassic. The whole, all, the whole strata is just gone. And so what that implies is not only did half the planet get ripped off, but the bit that didn't get ripped off 
also got shaved, you know. And um, so something very, very powerful was happening, you know, and this is a little illustration of Earth getting torn apart. And coinciding with all that geological drama, uh, suddenly, you know, biological diversity just, boom, stopped. You know, so at the Permian extinction, pretty well everything died. And when people think about it, we say 95% of the species disappeared. But it's more like 99.9999% of all living things disappeared. And just a few survivors got through to then regenerate life on this planet. Um, okay, now I'm going to change the subject again. It's going to be pulled together at the end. And I'm going to talk about the Earth and the Moon. Um, spacecraft take lovely pictures these days. So this one was taken from 204 million kilometers away by a Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter using a camera, and they, that is us and the Moon. And this was taken more recently, which is a very cool little video. And this was during the flyby of Juno. Juno is a spacecraft that was launched, went, did a loop around the solar system, went back to the Earth, did a high-speed flyby, and then whoosh, out to Jupiter. Now it should run, if it's going to behave itself, yes. Now this is from the spacecraft, and you watch this. The spacecraft is flying towards Earth. I don't think you can see there's a little moon there. It gets bigger because the spacecraft gets closer. But this is the moon. The reason it's spreading out and getting bigger is because the spacecraft is going whoosh, straight towards the Earth. Because what it does, it, it almost crashes into Earth, but it uses that fall to accelerate out of Jupiter. But that just gives you a flavor of the relative sizes of the objects we're talking about. So I'm going to stop in a moment, it's not going to crash. <laughs> Boom, okay. Now, where does the moon come from? Actually, 1881, uh, this geophysicist, British geophysicist, um, already came up basically with the idea that some large object, some extreme tidal forces ripped the moon out of Earth. And, um, and he also agreed that the Pacific was the site where the moon took off. So that's um, Osmond Fisher, very intelligent and far-thinking person. Okay, I won't dwell on this too much, but basic parameters are the moon is about a third, well, 27% of the Earth, but, um, I mean, in diameter, but it's only 2% of the volume. That's just basic geometry. Um, it's the rocks of the moon are much lower density than the rocks of the Earth. So, in fact, it's only 1.2% of the mass. And uh, the moon's mass can be explained by being made basically of basalt and granite, but not with no iron core. And um, if you, the volume of the moon is the same volume if you took off half the surface of the Earth down to 86 kilometers. Um, Okay, moon formation theories. I won't go into too much detail here, but there have been a, a variety of different ideas. At the end of um, the 20th century, giant impact model was the favored model. Uh, the Apollo missions um, eliminated the capture model because they showed that the moon rock was very similar to Earth rock. Um, and so the, the current idea is that this Mars-sized impactor whacked into the Earth 4.5 billion years ago and sprayed off lots of material. But the important point is when you have such an a collision, then what you're going to spray off is vapor and very hot liquid rock. It's not, you're not going to get chunky bits of solid rock. And also just, you may not be familiar, but there's such stark contrast between the near side of the moon and the far side of the moon. It's really asymmetric. And there's a nice picture of the giant impact, famous well-known picture. Um, but as I say, the problem is that Moon rock is not remelted earth rock. I told you, Apollo mission, they've already discovered that um, the moon's rocks are the same as earth rocks. It's like the moon rocks being, it's like earth rocks being cooked before it landed on the moon, but not, uh, not at very high temperatures or for very long. And you can measure this in terms of depletion of various volatile elements from the rocks. And these are just different types of moon rocks, basalt, that's um, uh, breca, and that's a, a granite-like rock. Um, in this uh, analysis of the moon rocks, they, developed, they found this thing called the siderophile, sorry, <laughs> siderophile problem. Um, basically what it is, is that the Earth was made from the material of certain types of meteorites, which contain these elements that normally dissolve very efficiently in molten iron. Um, 
and you find these meteorites, these pri uh, primordial uh, chondritic meteors, um, have the same ratios of these um, iron-loving elements, but the amount in Earth crust has been heavily depleted because all of these iron-loving elements were dissolved into the hot iron of the young planet. Um, the problem is that, and these are, these are the elements that have high affinity for molten iron, the problem is the earth rocks and moon rocks have almost the same proportions of these um, siderophile elements, which suggests they're made by the same process. The only problem is that the moon doesn't have a core, um, and so it never had a molten core. Um, okay, another problem. Lunar rocks are magnetized, but they're randomly magnetized, but there's no magnetic field on the moon. And the best explanation for these magnetized rocks on the moon is they're magnetized on Earth. Um, and so by this year, I think there's pretty much a consensus that moon rock equals Earth rock. I mean, it's the same stuff. And uh, you can look at it in many different ways, oxygen isotope ratios, you can look at chemical composition of rocks, the process rocks went through to get um, created. Um, and in addition, there's no evidence of this alien impactor. No one's found anything that could be a signature of this so-called rogue planet that whacked into us. Um, another story is that recently they've been finding heavy elements on the surface. I mean, this is not in the core crustal lunar rock. This is on the surface, it's in all the breckers and the creep rocks. Again, it's very strange because it seems that the moon gets showered with supernova debris on a regular basis. And so do we, because certainly in the Permian destruction layer, even in the Pleistocene destruction layer at the end of the Ice Age, you get a lot of this creep-like material. Something's coming through and dusting us with this stuff. Um, another point to, to focus on is the asymmetry. I mean, if the moon really formed from molten rock, it would be much more symmetrical. It's very asymmetric. So you've got all these you know, big depressions, you've got mountains on the side, far side, you've got the strange Maria as well. Inside the moon, it's strange, you know, the far side, you've got a thick crust, near side, you've got a thin crust. There's evidence of lots of cracks everywhere. Um, the central mass and central geometry are different. Um, how come that happened? What process made the moon? Uh, the Apollo missions, uh, when they'd finished with the lunar lander on Apollo uh, 12 and Apollo 13, they crashed these spacecraft into the moon and had seismic detectors on the surface. And what they found is the moon resonates. It's actually got cavities in it. So it's, it's, um, there's something strange about the internal structure of the moon as well. Um, I mean, the things we see when we look up in the sky every night and you see these dark patches on the moon, the Maria, there's also something strange about them because they are basically disks of basalt rock, which is identical to Earth basalt, the ocean floor rock, but they're just like pancaked down on the surface of the crust. They're not something that's bled up through the, um, the but they're not a volcanic feature. They're something that's landed on top of the moon. Uh, and again, just stressing that point, Mer the lunar basalt and the Earth basalt is the same stuff. And the only slight difference is that the lunar basalt's got more oxygen in it than the terrestrial basalt, and that can be explained by the fact that the basalt was exposed, I mean, Earth basalt was exposed to oxygen temporarily as it ripped out through the atmosphere. Um, another story is connected to the age of these rocks. Okay, when the Apollo missions were done, they found this strange problem with dating, that is the Maria basalt and the highland and northside white lunar rocks with different ages, and so they came up with this idea of what's called late heavy bombardment, to try and explain it. But in fact, a better explanation is these rocks came from Earth, and the outer rock of the crust of Earth cooled first and became solid, and then afterwards, the inner upper mantle rocks became solid. It was about 800 million year difference, and that's why you get different dates for these two types of rock. Um, other things, when you see pictures of them, you don't often see these, but they're real pictures from Apollo 15, you got a river, <laughs> a bit worrying. You got a cliff, which is sedimentary. Look, sedimentary layers. Those are made normally on Earth, in an underwater environment. So, it's building up stra strata of different rock. What are they doing on the Moon? There's not supposed to be any ocean on the Moon, any water. Um, that's another picture from Apollo 15. 
okay, you've got these mountains. Again, you've got this like stratified rock. You can see it there. Um, and the rocks on the far side are primarily this rock called a northosite, which is in fact formed on Earth at the base of the crust, not on the surface. It's something at the interface between the mantle and the crust. And I'll go into that in a moment. And this is called the northosite problem. So this is the stuff I'm talking about. So this is the, geo this is the geological column going to the center of the Earth. If you just take that very top bit, that's the crust. And that bottom of the crust, this is the interface between the mantle and the crust, is this stuff called a northosite. It's a white rock which has been recrystallized and recrystallized in a sort of geological process. It's very pure white material. And the problem is, it's out there on the moon. And how did it get there? And, okay, this is brought back by Apollo 15. And this was found on some hillside in Canada. <laughs> Same stuff. Um, and um, basically, the same rock has the same dates. It's about 4.5 billion years old. And um, it is it's formed by a, a sort of a cyclical recrystallization process. So it's a very pure, pure, pure material and crystalline. Um, but what we understand about an orthostite is this, that it's about half the mass of the crust. Um, it's a heat-processed meteoric rock called a northite. And um, it was, it's a slow sort of process that occurred over a period, probably um, half a billion years, during the formation of our planet. And it no longer happens, because our planet is too cool near the surface. But there's a massive manufacture of this white rock, which mostly is on the inside of the crust, not the outside of the crust. So it's a big mystery. Why is it on the outside of the crust? It shouldn't be there. You know, it's, it's supposed to be 50 kilometers down. But here we have a, a bit of uh, Greenland and Canada. And there's um, a north site there. Now, in fact, when you study the north site, you find not only is it in these, those two locations, but it's like, it's like a drop zone right across the planet where bits of the north site have been dropped on the surface of younger rocks. Uh, in fact, when people studied these uh, north site plutons in Norway, you actually find the lower surface is bowl-shaped and heat transformed, and it's smashed down onto other rocks which are younger, and also then become heavily fractured. It looks like this north site you get on the surface of Earth actually dropped from the sky. Okay. So we'll get on to when and how was the moon formed. So just throw in a few more other strange features. You've got, well, summarizing, we've got north site on the far side, which we said comes from the base of Earth's crust. Uh, we've got strange features like this basin here, the Aitken Basin, which is like six kilometers on average below the surface of the moon. Hard to explain if it was just a liquid rocks that uh, solidified. Uh, the near side uh, Maria, also a strange story. How did they form? And finally, the heavy creation you get on the far side is actually created by terrestrial material. It's not alien material. It's earth rock that's made those craters. Then you get to this, which is something very strange. Uh, this was published in Nature quite well, a couple of years ago. Um, you've got this strange square shape set of fractures in the near side of the moon. And this was discovered by two spaceships which were following the same path, and they could make very accurate measurements of the internal structure of the moon based on the gravity experienced by those spacecrafts. And so they, the data shows the moon is heavily fractured, faulted, and with strange cavities, and it's got a trap door for some reason. <laughs> And in addition, there's a trap door on the near side. And on the far side, you also get another square-shaped area. This is detected by the Clementine spacecraft, which is a high iron content zone on the far side. So some large-scale structure, internal structure on the moon as well. And finally, the thing that killed most of the other theories was this, that in the last 10 years, we're absolutely certain now there's water on the moon. And um, so all the other theories assume there's no water on the moon. Um, so first is the a north type rock was made in a wet environment. The lunar basalt was made in a wet environment. Uh, you even get things like apatite, which is a high water content rock on the moon. Um, you find water in volcanic deposits. You can launch probes at the moon's surface, and you can get water flared up from the impacts. And it even has ice caps. So. We really don't have another, we, don't, we currently don't have a good model to explain all this data. Um, 
there's another big problem. People assume generally the, the, the age of the moon is the same as the age of the rocks that you pick up on the moon. But there's a problem because the more we understand about solar system dust, the more we understand the moon is probably a lot younger than we think it is because you can calculate more or less how much dust should have accumulated in 4.5 billion years on the surface of the moon. And when they first did these experiments, they thought maybe got their calculations wrong because they landed the Apollo spacecraft on the moon and they found one to five centimeters of dust. Or I mean, on average, about five centimeters of dust on the whole of the moon. But when you now go to other solar system bodies, you find there's a meter of dust. So like on Phobos and Deimos and various asteroids, there's a meter of dust on these objects, which suggests that um, the moon is 20 times younger than a lot of these other bodies in the solar system. So the big question is, how old is the moon? You see hardly any dust here. Look, there's a footprint. There's no dust. The guys have been driving around in it. They're not wading through deep deposits. I mean, the evidence stacks up that the dust accumulation um, suggests 250 million years for the age of the moon. It coincides with the Permian mass extinction, the end of the Paleozoic era, age of the oldest basins, ocean floor rocks. Um, how can all this be the case? So I'm suggesting this. Now this is, I didn't do this, this is on the internet. Um, it's a very good new simulation program, which is almost a game. And there's a guy called Shinana Games who actually played with it, and it's really cool. And this, his idea is he put, he put Earth within the Roche limit of Jupiter and see what happens. And this is, this is, a, this is a real physics model, it works. And we see what's happening. It's the surface of the Earth is being ripped off. If you put that's if you put Earth close to Jupiter, that's what happens. And that's how the Moon formed. That's how the ocean basins formed. Except it wasn't Jupiter. It was something else. It was this star core that did it. But this is this is this is real physics. It's not a fantasy. Okay. So the basic idea is the Caesarean Moon birth. That is that the Starkle flew so close to us, briefly, there was a gravitational pulse that actually ripped off our crust on one side of the planet. It happened 250 million years ago and um, had a catastrophic effect on us. And the basic picture is, okay, this is actually 400,000 kilometers about the current separation from the Earth to the Moon. So this is, I've had to squeeze all the scales. And the, the speeds are important as well. So the velocity of Zeus is coming by at about 50 kilometers a second. The current orbital velocity of the moon is one kilometer per second. So what happened was there's this brief burst of tidal force and it starts to accelerate all our crustal fragments out. But because Zeus is going away so quickly, it disappears and then normal Earth gravity is restored. But by that point, the moon's in orbit. Okay. Um, and in terms of the geometry, because I showed you the model that, in fact, it's in this model over here, that it's, uh, the Zeus is orbiting almost perpendicular to the planets. So it came in from the north, and there's an orbital intersection. So around about June, we intersect with its orbit. And um, unfortunately, at that time, our, or we was, our orbital intersection was very close. And when we happened to be in the same place at the same time, you know, whoosh, we lost half our crust. So the effect was uh, the, basic, the main bulge towards Zeus was lining up with where the Hawaiian hotspot is. Um, an equivalent bulge actually occurred in Botswana, and in fact you still find that bit of Africa has got a strange dome to it. No one can explain where, where, how it was formed, but it's a tidal bulge. And this whole process was responsible for cracking the crust. And so what we consider is actually Pangaea is the remaining part of the crust which had been broken. Um, and the important thing is that one million kilometers, you have no gravity at the surface of Earth. When you get to 400,000 kilometers, you get negative gravity. So basically mountains can fly, everything can fly. It falls off, everything falls off the planet. Um, so basically our planet was peeled. It's like take a hard-boiled egg, pull off the shell. That's what happened. And um, so we're talking about approximately 50 kilometer thick shells of crust and maybe another 40 kilometer thick of basalt. And it's not completely uniform, so where the Hawaiian hotspot is, there's a much bigger sort of digging going on in the center of the, um, where the center of gravity between the two objects was. Um, you can calculate approximately how long it took. It took about five hours 
basically to rip off the crust. And then it took another four days for that stuff to move to the present orbit where the moon is now. And so basically the way the moon got up there, it was tugged. It's like a big tugboat, you know, it was pulled out into orbit. And um, because the Zeus was moving much faster, it was then left behind. And the, the inertia of all that rock was not, was so big, it didn't catch up with Zeus. Zeus took off and left the debris in orbit. And in fact, today, the moon still passes over Hawaii. I don't even know the, the latitude of the um, lunar orbit. So, in summary, the age of the moon is the same date as the Permian mass extinction. The difference in age between basalt, the lunar basalt and the lunar highlands is just to do with the difference in uh, time when the crust of Earth solidified. So, the outer crust you know, solidified first, then the upper mantle solidified 800 million years later. And it explains many things about the, the Earth as well. So, age of the ocean basins, age of the land. And so, in conclusion, Zeus performed a cesarean on Mother Earth to give birth to the moon. That's the theory. Very straightforward. And one last thing, a prediction. If I'm right, we're going to find Permian fossils on the moon. I, I didn't do a very good photoshopping because it would end up on the internet and everyone would say, they found them already! <laughs> All right. So, thank you very much for listening, and I hope I've opened your minds. So, questions? Yes, now you, you've got uh, Zeus coming uh, perpendicular to the plane of the Earth. Wouldn't that have set up the moon in a, an orbit perpendicular to the Earth? Yes, that's true. So, in fact, at the pit point that the moon took off, I'll do this model, right? Zeus is up here, and the moon started off going round, actually uh, perpendicular. To in the same plane, sorry, as, as Zeus, okay? But tidal forces um, have any, we know this already from other experiments with the moon and its orbit, then slowly made it change its orientation towards the plane of the ecliptic. So, it, so basically the, um, the orbit has precessed, the lunar orbit has precessed over 250 million years. Well, was the uh, mountain building that you were talking about, did, all that, did this happen at the same time, or have you got several? There have been several mountain building events, but the, there's definitely a very active mountain range formation at the end of the Permian. Suddenly these mountain ranges form, and in fact there's another period of mountain building at the end of the Pleistocene. So just at the end of the Ice Age, there's evidence of change of topography of mountains as well. And in fact, there's a very good book that was written I don't know, 20 years ago now called The Earth Nearly Died. Um, and in that book, they detail, in fact, I actually, you know, I quote them heavily in, in my book, Stark Wars Use, because it's some very good data, it's just saying, but they were focusing on the end Pleistocene story, but I was saying this is something general. <laughs>